Hey everybody, I would like to introduce you to uh, Mark Kirby. Mark was a colleague of mine for many years at Oxford Industries, if memory serves me correctly. We actually brought you out of Auburn University, your first job yep. at Oxford, Linear yep. Close. Uh, so I'm an Auburn guy, don't hold that against me. He was an Auburn guy, but the good news is, I've had put two boys through Georgia and got one here, daughter here now, so sitting right there trying to be inconspicuous. <laughs> <laughs> and one of your sons is a famous uh, musician. Well, not quite. I don't know. My, uh, my middle son, if any of you guys are into the kind of the, the pop music scene around Athens, he's in a band called Mothers. Uh, if y'all know Mothers, yeah, he's the lead guitarist for Mothers. So yeah, they're currently in London right now playing a couple of gigs. So I'm hoping it's successful so I can get him off the family uh, payroll. So. <laughs> anyway, but they're coming back. You. They're back. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll advertise a little bit. March 4th, Friday night, they're at Caledonia. Is that right, yes. Laura? They're having kind of the launch party concert yeah. for their for their album. So if you're around March 4th, go to Caledonia and, and see them. And then on the 5th, they're playing a show in Atlanta. Yeah, then they're in Atlanta the 5th. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to go catch that one. But yeah, go see Drew. Cool. So Mark is VP of operations for Oxford, Indu uh, Oxford Industries corporately. He's over the time of Bahama and all the different, he'll tell you all about everything he does, so I'll leave it at that. And I'm kind of glad we have a small class. I'm going to expect at least one question from everybody, okay? Because I think the questions are usually the best part of these. Um, I don't know if any of you had uh, knew or ever had any classes with Miss Blaylock uh, before she moved to China. Yeah, I did, I did this same lecture in her class a couple years ago, and the best part of it was the discussion, you know, after, after my sort of canned PowerPoint, right? But... Anyway, so Oxford Industries, we are uh, a fortune, not a fortune, but we are a New York Stock Exchange uh, publicly traded company. We are a portfolio-based company, meaning we have a, a parent company, which is in Atlanta where I work, and then we own um, a, a group of apparel brands that all sort of function independently of each other. So I'm sure uh, our biggest part of our business and our most famous brand uh, primarily a men's brand, but we do do, do some ladies, is Tommy Bahama. Uh, we have a store at Phipps. If anybody's ever at Phipps, go, go spend some money. And then I'm sure most of you ladies have heard of Lily Pulitzer. Hopefully you own a piece or two of it. Uh, we acquired the Lily Pulitzer brand about five years ago, uh, and that's our second largest. At the time, it was, it was uh, our third largest, and it has grown. They have been so successful. Uh, with, with our investment in their, their business. Um, and now they are our second largest business. And they, we have a, a company-owned store at Phipps for them as well. Of course, we have stores all over, but those are the closest ones. That's why I'm pointing those out. And then, uh, I think back in the summer, a signature store, it's what we call them. It's kind of like a franchise open, the Cloister Collection over on, is it Hull Street, I think? Right down from Trapeze and, and uh, Last Resort in that little block. Um, so Lanier Clothes, that's where Greg and I worked together for many, many years. Uh, they make tailored clothing, menswear, things like, like what I've got on here. Uh, and then we have a golf business, and not only do they do golf apparel, but they also supply uh, several what we call special project customers, and one of them is here in Athens, Onward Reserve. They have a store right by Pauly's. Uh, so we make uh, all of their uh, clothing that has their little Onward Reserve bear on it. So we're their, we're their private label supplier. Uh, their business has, has grown quite a bit from their the original store here in Athens. So that's a little bit about us. As Greg said, I'm a, I've been there for my whole career. Uh, April will be 32 years in the apparel business. Uh, I started when I was eight. Um, some of y'all are supposed to laugh. That's, come on, tough crowd. Well, so anyway, I always start with this. I'm going to talk about the whole apparel supply chain. And one thing I want to talk about is... Um, whether you go into the apparel industry when you get out of Oxford or you go into other industries, if you're involved in the supply chain at all, the apparel supply chain is really not different than the supply chain for toys or televisions or, you know, really any kind of consumer product. So we're going to talk specifically about apparel. I think that's what y'all are most interested in if you're in the TMI program. But it really is a very generic, generic discussion. I'm also going to summarize the apparel. I'm going to summarize the apparel supply chain into about eight or nine slides and talk about the major functions. But this, I found this years ago, and I like to show it, how many different discrete steps there are to go from a cotton field 
to a pair of men's uh, cotton, or in this case, I guess, ladies' cotton trousers. There's just, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of steps. This probably doesn't even identify all of them. But I'm going to roll all of those up and just sort of talk about the major, uh, the major functions. So a lot of you guys are probably very aware of some of these steps. You may be taking a, a product development class. Uh, you probably know what the term a tech pack is and things like that. So I've kind of collapsed design and development. They're really very different things. The design people really come up with the initial concepts and ideas, and they might sketch something out on a piece of paper. They might see something on a runway. Uh, and then the product development people really take that idea and turn it into what I call like a recipe. A tech pack is really a recipe for making the garment, just like the recipe for making chocolate cookies. The ingredients and how you put them together to have a batch of cookies, it's the same, really the same concept. So I talk about some of the inputs here. Uh, creativity and inspiration really drive design. Uh, color and product trends uh, are a key part of this. Uh, we also obviously take into account what I call past successes. What kind of products, what kind of looks, what kind of prints. Lily Pulitzer is very print driven. Uh, what's been selling well for us or what's been selling well for somebody else. And you know, I, I'm not in this end of the business. I'm really in the back end, the grunt end of the business. So I like to make fun of the design people and say that there really are hardly ever any original creations. Everybody's taking somebody else's idea and morphing it a little bit. Um, but um, the, the, the design and product development uh, really are, are driven by the very creative people and we're fortunate that we have a lot of those. We actually consider one of the strengths of our business the fact that we have very, very talented designers. Uh, the product development people turn it into the recipe we talked about. How do you make it? What do you make the product from? Uh, we do use uh, product development management software. PDM systems is kind of the industry term. Um, we actually use different ones across the company because those businesses came into Oxford at different times. So that's, you know, people say, well, why would you use the same system? Well, that's why. It's probably work calling you right now. Yeah, it sure is. Um, so, but we use a couple of different systems, and product development management systems are really uh, tools to store all the data at the style or product level, and most of the ones now are collaborative. So whoever's putting measurements in goes and puts measurements in. Whoever's putting the trim package uh, in does that. Whoever is doing the graphics does that, and it allows people to, to sort of, you know, collaborate together to end up with a finished product. So, merchandising sort of the next step, and this guy that worked for Oxford for a long, long time, he had the best definition of merchandising that I've ever heard, and he called it the intersection of the creative and the commercially practical. So, the designers would say, let's just make everything, right? It all looks so cool, let's make it all that, you know, we spent days and days creating this lily print and this silhouette, and we think it would be great. Well, the commercial people are the ones, the merchandisers have to decide what do we think is going to sell. So they take these hundreds of ideas each season and they have to define the spring 16 line or the fall 16 line. You know, we usually work seasonally. Um, and a key thing that merchandisers do is decide how much inventory we're going to produce for each style. So merchandisers have to have a very, they, they really have to have the product appreciation, but they also have to have a good business sense because they are making a very, the first big financial decision for the company because they are going to decide how much inventory we buy, and inventory is very, very expensive. So those of you who, uh, if you, uh, we, we were heard a presentation the other day from um, uh, one of the professors about the, the consumer analytics certificate now that's available here. Uh, consumer economics is a major here at FACS, uh, but those skills and those kind of things and an appreciation for the product, which most of you have from the other courses you're exposed to here, make a pretty good background for merchandising. Merchandising also, if you're in the retail end of the business, would be buying, the buying departments, same thing. We've got all this cool stuff we'd like to put on the floor at Macy's, but we can't afford to put it all there. We need to have to pick what we think is going to sell and then how much of it can we afford to order. So buyers are the merchandisers in the retail end of the business. So, um, you know, again, they've got a lot of inputs they have to consider. They want to look at market data, what sold and what didn't sell, right? Uh, we also, as soon as we get a line together, 
uh, we'd like to get some early feedback from our customers. So in, in, in the case, and I'll use Lily Pulitzer, I think that's the most relevant brand to, to, to you guys. Uh, we'll bring the store managers in and they'll see the line and they obviously are very in touch with their local customers and so we want their feedback about which styles that they think should be in the line and which ones do they think they need to have you know as sort of an attraction piece but we don't want to put a lot of inventory in it this is going to be a core style we're going to sell a ton of them and we want to buy a lot of those um, also for our wholesale business we sell Lily Pulitzer to Belk uh, we sell Lily Pulitzer uh, uh, well, Belk's probably our biggest wholesale customer, so we also want to give an early preview to the Belk people and get an idea from them, what do they think, right? Uh, the problem here when I say early feedback from sales, the amount of time it takes you to get the products made into the U.S., and we're going to talk about that in a minute, is it's a, it's a long period of time. It's about six months from the time you place an order until you're going to have the stuff, so you're doing a lot of speculating here. So unfortunately, we can't go out and show people samples and poll our customers through social media and have all that information and then decide what we want to order, right? That'd be great. We'd never buy the wrong thing. We'd never buy too much of something. We wouldn't have to sell stuff off to TJ Maxx, right? Or run e-commerce sales in August at half off or 75% or off, right? But it doesn't work like that. You don't have time to do that. So you've got to get a little bit of feedback and then you've got to make some speculation or make some speculative buys. Um, merchandisers deal with the pricing of the product, right? How much are we going to sell it for, right? So you can sort of work that one way or the other. And generally, we work it from the retail price backwards. We decide what do we want to retail it for, and then we back out our desired margin, and then we back out all the other components of the cost and see if it works. And sometimes we find out, whoops, that means we've got to source that blouse for $20 first cost from the factory to hit our margin and the current prices that we've gotten from our sourcing people, we're going to talk about sourcing in a minute, uh, they're like 21 or 22. So do we think we could up the retail price a little bit or do we have to go beat on the procurement people to find a factory that might be able to do it for 20? Or do we want to take something out of it? Maybe we were going to put some embellishments on it or some things and we're like, you know, it's still probably with just a little bit of embroidery it still looks like we want it to look, and it'll still sell, and it'll knock a dollar off the cost, and now we're at our point. So, so the merchandisers are, are very uh, involved in deciding what we're gonna what we're gonna sell it for. Sourcing. So this really sort of gets more into the part of the business that that, that I work in, and then the, the subsequent steps. So the sourcing people are basically tasked with selecting the best place to produce the products that we want to produce, and in the quantities that we want. Uh, based on a couple of key criteria, cost, quality, lead time, uh, those criteria can be in various orders of priority, right? Uh, if we are in our, in our Lanier Clothes, our menswear group, if we're trying to get a uh, program with Costco, right? Anybody shop Costco? I love Costco. I mean, anything I don't get through the company, I probably buy it at Costco. Uh, so if we're trying to produce, which we have and which we do right now, we sell Costco, a 100% cotton, wrinkle resistant men's chino pant. And it's actually constructed like a dress pant more than it is a casual pant. Costco retails those pants for $19.99. It's a $20 pair of pants. Uh, send your dad there, it's the best $20 pair of pants you'll ever buy, I have every color. Um, so obviously cost is a big deal if you're trying to get a 300 or 400,000 unit order from Costco, right? It cost drives it. You still got to be quality. It's still got to be deliverable when Costco wants it. The cost is a big thing. Now with Lily Pulitzer, quality is going to be at the top. Lily has a company strategy of delivering A plus product, delight our customers. Never have a, a customer disappointed in something because of the quality. Cost is important. You got to hit your targets and lead time. You know we can't wait a year to get something. But you know, so the point there is depending on what channel of business we're we're after at the retail end. Those criteria can bop around, you know, in, in different different orders of priority. Uh, the sourcing people work very closely with the product development people because part of product development is you want to see a sample, right? It's great to see it on paper, see a sketch, a picture, see a CAD drawing of something, but until you actually see the garment, you really don't know if your recipe is right. You may realize that you, you know, the armhole's too tight, or it really needs to be an inch longer when you put it on a, a fit model. So. 
uh, the sourcing people are very involved in getting the prototype samples produced and sent to the product development people. Um, and obviously you're sampling products at the factory where you think you're going to make it. But we usually kind of, we like to have two options, you know, two factories that can potentially make each product that way. We have a little bit of negotiating power with what we're going to pay them for it. Uh, but you do your product development sampling with those factories that you expect to make it. You don't want to have somebody produce a beautiful sample and then expect another factory to start from scratch and make the production garments exactly as good as the sample was made. It you know, it'd be, would, wouldn't make any sense. Um, so our sourcing people also work on negotiating a final price with the fi factory, with the supplier, uh, and the terms of sale. Any of you guys, Laura, what's the class y'all are, is it accounting, intro accounting? Spotty. Anybody take that? If you take it, they, they're, they're talking about uh, how you record inventory on your books and when you record it, but uh, INCO terms is basically the, the rules that govern what the seller is responsible for and what the buyer is responsible for. And I, it's inside the company periodically with our, with our brands, I do like a whole hour just on INCO terms and obviously we don't have time for that, but I'll give you uh, an example of INCO terms. If you buy a, a dress uh, from a Chinese supplier for $20 and you use the ENCO term FOB, okay? Uh, if you buy that dress from a supplier and you pay them $30 DDP, FOB and DDP are different price bases under ENCO terms. FOB means the supplier is going to make the thing and they're going to deliver it in their country to a port where I'm going to put it on a ship or plane, and at that point they've sold it to me. So they're selling it to me in Shanghai, China for $20. That's an FOB purchase. A lot of people, especially smaller companies who aren't sophisticated enough to handle international logistics and customs things, which we're going to get to in a minute as well, they might want to buy something from a supplier that's going to make it for them, going to ship it across the Pacific, going to get it here, going to file an import uh, transaction with U.S. Customs, pay the U.S. Customs import tax, and then I can go pick it up in Savannah. That's a DDP. And obviously it's more than that because that supplier's got more costs to get something to Savannah cleared of U.S. Customs than just to get it to Shanghai for me to put it on the ship. So that's what income terms are. There's about 20 of them, I think, and they govern all kinds of things. Some are specific to certain commodities like buying bulk fuel oil and it doesn't apply to our industry. But I would say FOB and DDP are the most common in the apparel industry and really in the soft goods or the consumer products industry. You either are sophisticated enough, you want to buy it close to the manufacturing location and handle the logistics and the rest of the supply chain, or you're not. You don't want to mess with that. You want to pay somebody to do that for you. So sourcing people usually issue purchase orders, and in this advanced day and age of digital everything, our industry our suppliers in Asia and South America still want a hard copy purchase order that somebody signed, right? So there's an example of what one of our purchase orders looks like for Lily Pulitzer product. Lily Pulitzer, by the way, is legally called Sugartown Worldwide. The brand is called Lily, but that's the name of the corporation. Um, so, and you never issue a purchase order to the factory and not have to change it, right? A week after you've issued the purchase order and the factory gets going on it, somebody has a meeting with another wholesale customer and they're like, man, we really like this. But you know, in our market, we buy a higher percentage of smalls than we do in other markets. So all of a sudden it's like, oh God, we gotta see if we can change the size scale of the order. So we have to amend the order. So a lot of things, usually market driven, will cause us to have to change an order and the sourcing people handle that. And then once something's in work, they track it and make sure it's going to ship on time and tell us back in the U.S. where it's at. You know, the fabric's there. Oh, they're cutting it now. All the trim came in. It's in sewing. It's in packaging. It had final inspection. It's ready. You know, so they're keeping us up to date as things move through the, the production cycle. The production cycle itself, you ladies and are probably pretty familiar with how to put a garment together, uh, either you've taken a class on it or maybe a parent or a grandparent. Um, and you know, it's really kind of a, uh, an interesting observation on, on today in my generation, and this is gonna, you know, sound maybe sexist. When I was in high school, 
girls would, a lot of girls would take home economics, right? And in home economics, you learn how to sew. Well, I don't think home economics is even taught anymore. I mean, I, you know, I know my kids, when they went through high school, it didn't exist. So I don't know that where anybody would learn how to sew anymore, you know, if you, if you go to, to, to school in the U.S. So, uh, but the way you put a garment together uh, is really there are not a lot of variations into how you sew a blouse together or how you sew a man's woven shirt together or how you sew a jacket together. And the, the reason I'm, I'm talking about that is the result is that if you go into a garment factory really anywhere in the world, and Greg's been in a lot of them, they're all, they all look the same. They're all laid out the same. The only difference is what, what's the ethnicity of the operators. Are they Chinese? Are they Colombians? Are they Dominicans? Are they Thai? Are they Indians, right? But uh, most garment factories inside look the same. They look like this. They have all of the machines lined up and different operations happen in a different sequence. You've got some people whose job is just to move the subassembled parts around and get them to the right operator. They're also very loud. Anybody ever been in one in a sewing factory? Okay. There aren't any in the U.S. anymore, hardly, so it'd be hard to visit one unless you went on one of the, the trips, uh, the China trip. They, they go to garment factories, although that's not happening this summer. I heard we didn't have enough participation. Um, they're very loud. Industrial sewing machines make a <laughs> sound when you step on the pedal. It's <laughs> so imagine sitting there all day and going <laughs> and putting it over there and taking two pieces and going <laughs> and putting it over there. So um, not to get off, you know, kind of on a, a political soapbox here, but you know, there's. We, I was talking about this at the at the fashion show with some people the other night. Uh, actually, it's Professor Weibel, Miss Weibel. Do y'all know her? I was talking to her and her husband about it, and we were talking about you know how the apparel industry migrated out of the U.S. and it went offshore, and almost all our clothes are imported now. And I said, you know, the reality is, if you wanted to start up a factory making ladies blouses here in Athens, you'd have a hard time finding anybody to work there. First of all, they wouldn't know how to sew, and if they did, they, people don't want to do that work. You guys don't want to sew in a hot sewing factory for eight, eight hours a day. So the apparel industry, I think, sort of moved offshore. It was going to happen sooner or later, and it did. Uh, at the same time, and we'll, I think i touch on this later, uh, we certainly understand that those are difficult jobs, and we t uh, spend a lot of time and effort and money making sure that our garments are produced in factories that treat the people well, that pay them a living wage, give them all of the required benefits of the country. Uh, so th at least to make what is normally a, a hard thing to do for eight or 10 hours a day, you know, as, as palatable as it can be. Anyway, so you put all, starting up here, let me run back a little bit. These guys are cutting out parts. You can't see it on that piece of paper, but it's laying on top of, you know, 40 or 50 layers of fabric. And the paper has the pattern part sketches on it. Now they're cutting by hand. He's got an electric knife and he's wearing a mail, chain mail glove so he doesn't cut himself and he's cutting out all those parts by hand. Uh, a lot of sophisticated companies and a lot of U.S. companies who still produce in the Caribbean basin where they can, where they, they can afford the investment will have computer driven cutters. So uh, where Greg and I worked we had a, a, a Gerber is the company cutter and it ran off of a tape and the tape knew what the pattern piece looked like. So you could just stand there and this little knife's going, zzz, you know, just cut them out automatically. But those are very, very expensive. And so depending on, again, what country you're producing in and what kind of price point your retail product's in, it might not make sense to spend $2.5 million on a computer-driven cutter if the people who work in Guatemala can cut it out just fine by hand and they're paid two fifty an hour because that's the, the, the going wage in, in, in Guatemala. Um, and we can come back and talk about the, the, the social compliance aspects when we're done. That's a good question to answer topic. I usually get questions about that. So they're sewing it into a garment down here. Last stage is people will press, fold, make sure the price tickets and all and fold it up and put it into boxes. And then those boxes are going to head to the U.S. So for the most part, virtually everything we uh, procure for our brands when it leaves the factory, it's ready to go into the store. It's in a bag with a price, the ticket, all the other Chachki stuff on it. It's it's store ready. Um, quality control, I didn't touch on that. A big deal. We have over 50 people around the world, employees whose sole job is quality assurance and quality control. 
So they're visiting factories while things are in work, trying to identify, doing inspections and random samplings. Isn't there a class like some here, quality something? Yes, yeah. there you go. Okay, very good. So they're doing that kind of stuff, testing fabric, testing, uh, pulling up samples of garments that are partially constructed and measuring them and checking them. You'd love to, if there's a problem, you'd rather find it while it's being made because then you have a pretty good chance of correcting it. But we also do a final inspection. Once it's finished, our auditor will pull a sampling of the thousand blouses and measure and inspect visually. Are there stains? Are there creases? Is it sewn together right? I'm going to measure a small. Does it measure to the small spec? Measure a medium, measure a large, etc. When you find problems in final inspect, depending on what the problem is, you may or may not be able to mitigate the problem. Sometimes we get down to that very last step and we have to decide if it's commercial or not. Sometimes we don't. We tell the factory you can't ship it. It's just not, not good enough for us. Doesn't happen too often. So now we take all those boxes loaded with all this beautiful product and we deliver them to a, I, I guess in reality, uh, the factory will deliver them to a company we have selected that will receive them and stuff them into a container. Anybody know what an ocean container is, what it looks like? Anybody been to Savannah? Any other people? You go to Savannah, you're down on River Street, having a cocktail, hopefully, you know, legally, and all of a sudden you look up and here's, it's like a whole wall of a building is going up the river past you. It's a big container ship. It has about 6,000 boxes on it uh, that are about, each one about the third the size of this room. So a 40 foot container, 40 feet long, eight feet high, about eight feet wide, is a standard, thing that people ship in and people ship in containers for the same reason that you pack your stuff into a suitcase when you're going to fly. You don't walk onto the plane, you know, with your arms bundled on your clothing, right, and fold it up, put it in the overhead. You put it into something and then you move that thing. That's what containerized shipping's about. And uh, the first step is to get your goods counted and loaded into a container. That container is usually loaded at a warehouse that's not actually where the ships are. So then you have to pull that container, and that's a container of a truck, and put it on a ship. Here's the view of a big ship in Hong Kong Harbor getting loaded with all those containers, right? Um, and again, you know, for 30 minutes you could talk about the technology of how they load ships. It's really cool. They load them based on the ship's going to stop at multiple places, and they know exactly how to load them so that when they stop at this place, these come off and they're all in one spot on the ship and these will come on to go to the port that the ship's going to next. It's, it's a ship loading is a science in and of itself. I don't know where you go to learn that. I don't think you can take a, get a master's in ship loading. Um, so then, you know, most of our stuff, this is how it gets to us here. Uh, I used a map of China, uh, about 60% of Oxford's total products. That's Lily, Tommy Bahama, Lanier Clothes, Oxford Golf, all of our private label uh, special program business, about 60% of it comes out of China. Uh, and that's how it gets here. It comes across the Pacific. If it's going to Tommy Bahama, Tommy Bahama's operation is in rainy old Seattle, which doesn't fit with their tropical image, but that's where the company was founded and where it operates from. So they shoot straight across to Seattle. Then the stuff for Lilly and the other brands comes here to the U.S. coast ports, and it gets through the Panama Canal, right? So that's how it works. There's a picture. If you haven't seen a container ship at the bottom, there's a blow up of a big ship that, like I said, holds about 6,000 of those, of those containers. And if that ship, it'd be interesting if you could, you know, have an x-ray vision and you could look at all those containers. It has anything you can think of that you would buy in any store here. I mean, we, we really kind of take uh, for granted that you can go into the Super Kroger up on Alps and you can buy uh, black cherries in the middle of the winter. Well, they came from Chile, right? You can buy avocados. You can buy, you know, all of your clothes if you look at the label on the back. They, they all came from somewhere, probably not the U.S. They came from any one of, you know, two dozen countries. They all get here that way down there. Uh, container comes off the ship. Usually it gets moved and it has to wait sitting in a stack until customs release. So I'm talking about this a little bit more than I would because, uh, again, if you're buying all of your product from overseas and you're bringing it to the U.S., 
getting it through U.S. Customs is a pretty big deal, okay? You can't just bring stuff in without Customs letting you. Who's traveled outside the country? You come back, fly attendant hands you what? That little blue form? You fill out your name, where you've been, your address, and what you buy, right? And you can bring what, like, now it's like two grand, two thousand dollars of stuff back. I'm declared two hundred, and it's just one up to eight hundred. So yeah, so that little form, right? And if you, you know, if you're bringing back a couple of fur coats, you got you'll, I know you've done it, but the customs people will stop, and you got to write a check for the import tax for that. So it never affects y'all, because like me, I never bring back more than the allowance that's free. So up to X amount is free. There's no import duty, right? Above that, there's an import duty, and they literally will look at your stuff. Ask you how much you paid for it. You can say, well, here's a receipt. I paid $1,000 for that fur coat. And they'll be like, okay. And you look at this big book that's about this thick. It's like, okay, the import duty rate on fur coats is 16.5%. Okay, write us a check for $165. So that happens, not to any of us. You know, we're normal people, but it happens. The reason I'm talking about that is you have to do the same thing for merchandise. It's just that that form is much more complex than the little, you know, fill it out by hand. It really looks very much like a tax form. Um, because, and it is a tax form. You're describing what the stuff is, who you are that's bringing in the U.S., and then based on what it is in that big thick book, everything has its own unique import duty rate, and you calculate the duties yourself, and you pay them yourself. Customs reviews it, and make sure they like it, and then they tell you you can come get your stuff at the port. So until all that happens, you can't just bring something to the country and go pick it up and, and do something with it. you got. you got to go through the whole U.S. Customs regime. I forgot I had this slide. I would have shown it to you. I was talking about it. So here's what a, uh, a customs declaration looks like. Uh, customs will inspect a random limited number of shipments just to make sure you don't have any bombs or ISIS guys hiding out in the container, things like that. Thankfully, they don't inspect a lot of our stuff. We're in a program that, kind of a good guy program, so they consider us to be low risk because of a bunch of things we do with customs on the side to keep them uh, educated about our business practices. So we don't have many inspections. The reason I say you don't want an inspection is not because we don't want to keep the country safe, but an inspection delays things. It can cost you two or three days, sometimes a week, right at the end of the whole cycle, right? So I ordered something six months ago, and I've been waiting for it. It got made, then it came across the Pacific. It took five weeks to get to Savannah, and it's finally in Savannah. I don't want a one-week delay a week and a half before I expect to start putting it out on my floor, right? Or a week and a half before Belk expects to have it. So you don't want inspections if you can help it. Uh, what else is interesting about uh, our industry? Oh, textiles and apparel. Customs has different commodities of products that they consider to be sensitive products. Uh, textiles and apparel are considered a sensitive product. Uh, they are a sensitive product primarily because Textiles and apparel pay the highest duty rates of anything that's imported into the U.S. Did y'all know that? Our industry pays the highest duty rates. So you can look at that from two perspectives. One is, um, as an importer, it's like we know we have a certain amount of, of cost of running our business that's going to be spent toward paying import duties. You could look at it from the socially active role and say somebody who lives in the poor part of town who goes to Walmart to buy a pair of polyester capri plant pants, right? That's all she can afford, and they're $9.99. The import duty rate on man-made fibers is almost 30%. So a couple of dollars of her $9.99 capri pants are an import duty, it's a tax. So you can argue that it's a, it's a regressive tax that poor people pay, rich people pay, but, but, but uh, uh, a lot of the products that everybody buys, apparel and footwear especially, pay high duty rates. So there's been a big argument for many years that they ought to be the lowest duty rates, but the argument hadn't gotten very far. <laughs> the reason duty rates are high, I'm going to give you a little historical tangent here. Um, the import duty rate for silk garments into the U.S. is zero. You don't pay any duty. The import duty rate for man-made fibers is... 27 to 29 and a half percent. If anybody can tell me why they think the U.S. set 
import tariff duty rates high on man-made fibers, and they don't, they're free for silk. <coughs> I'll buy you a beverage at, where are we going, Bar South tonight? Is that right? <laughs> Parents' night or something like that? What do you think? You're warm. You're warm. You're on the right track. Is it because we don't like we don't, like produce our own, so they don't want you importing them? You're uh, between the two of you. You basically have got it. U.S. Uh, duty rates were set to protect U.S. industries. Okay. As far as I know, to this day, there are no silkworm farms in North America. You can't produce silk in North America, so there was no silk industry to protect with a tariff. Meanwhile. Things, I know everybody's heard of things like nylon, right? Invented in the U.S., right? The whole man-made fiber industry was invented in the U.S. Our guys invented that stuff. So we had, a, and we had for years and years, and we still have a large uh, man-made fiber industry. Now a lot of the fiber gets produced here, and then the fiber gets shipped overseas to be spun into fabric and turned into clothes, right? But 3M and those comp DuPont, those companies invented that, were big industries, so duty rates were generally set if there was a U.S. industry to protect. And we did have a big textile apparel industry for a while, but we don't anymore, and that's another argument. Why are the duty rates so high on apparel when there's not a domestic industry to protect anymore, right? And the high duty rates didn't protect it anyway. It migrated offshore in spite of the, 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 the tariff protections because labor cost is such a big part of, of making apparel. Yes, ma'am? Um, so if you, even if the fibers are made here in the United States, once and let's say you export them to be made into fabric, you're still getting a tax, even though those fibers were made in the U.S. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you said there. There are some programs. If you uh, customs assesses, uh, you know, duty the duty rate of a product. Um, you pay duty on a product if it is of foreign origin. And customs has a lot of very specific rules about what the country of origin is of a product. And if you think about products, you know, let's make it real easy. If I grow corn in Mexico, well, back up, let's do it better. If I grow and harvest agave syrup in Mexico and somebody in Texas, in Texas imports it to distill tequila from it, it's pretty simple. The agave was grown in, in Mexico. It's Mexican agave syrup, right? Now, think about her example. I'm going to spin fiber in the U.S., and I'm going to send the fiber to China, and they're going to weave it into, or they're going to knit it into some jersey fabric, right? And that jersey fabric is going to get sent to Bangladesh to be cut and sewn into garments. What's the country of origin? In apparel, the country of origin is almost always where the major production operations are done, the major seaming operations. So in that example, the country of origin of that sweatshirt is Bangladesh. Uh, and you pay 29.5% duty on it, uh, even though it might have been made from fibers that were produced in a U.S. mill. Now there are some programs, uh, some special trade programs where you can get a kind of a deduction off your duty bill by using some U.S. things, but um, in general, what I just described is, is, is kind of the way our world works. Uh, what else? I mentioned sensitive. I talked about duty rates. Uh, textile apparel, alcohol is a sensitive category to customs, um, and things that are sensitive categories, when customs says, okay, We've looked at your paperwork, you've paid your duties, you can go send the truck and get your stuff at Savannah and take it wherever you're taking it, right? Uh, they have the right for six, up to six more months to tell you to bring it back to them if you didn't do something right. So they're conditionally released to you for six months. Um, and I think we had, you know, a worst case scenario, and I'll, I'll give you a real life example. Uh, one of the customs, in addition to assessing Im import duties and, and managing the trade side of it, customs is also tasked with enforcing any other government agency uh, law if, it, if, if the enforcement occurs at the border, right? So customs also makes sure that if you're importing that fur coat, it's not from an endangered species, right? Uh, so they, so they, they uh, enforce fish and wildlife rules. They also enforce... Uh, 
God, what else? Product safety, consumer product safety commission rules, things like that. Well, the FTC is the governing agency in the U.S. that sets all the rules for all of the writing that's in the labels in your clothes, right? Do you ever buy some Levi's or something and they have a label you pull it out your pants and it like goes down because it's got all this stuff on it, all these languages and all that. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, says apparel has to have the country of origin, has to have the care instructions, the fiber content, blah, 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 blah. That's not a customs rule, that's an FTC rule, but customs enforces that rule. So, the worst thing in the world that can happen to you is to find out that you made this beautiful product and it sold to the piece and six months, you know, you, you designed it, developed it, and had it made, it came all the way across the ocean and you shipped it to Belk, they loved it, and you, you know, they, they took every piece you ordered, right? And then suddenly, somehow, some way, uh, an FTC person finds out that, well, wow, you didn't put the country of origin in the label. That's, you're breaking a rule. So customs can issue a re-delivery notice. So they can say, you need to bring those 10,000 blouses back to Savannah and fix the garment marking on them, and then you can have them again. Well, think about it. At that point in time, Five, all, you know, five months and 28 days later, if customs did that, uh, we can't return that stuff. And y'all are already wearing it, right? We got to go to Belk and say, send us back what you hadn't shipped. And they're like, well, God, it was popular. It's all sold. So you can't re-deliver it. If you could, you do what I said. You take it back and you have somebody cut the old label out and sew a new one in. And that's not cheap. You can imagine that. It takes a lot of time. Your customer's disappointed, right? If you can't send it back, what happens? you pay a fine that's equivalent to the value of the merchandise. So, you know, lots and lots of money. So anyway, I'm not bad. Customs does a good job, but customs, uh, the, the, the customs regime as it applies to the imports of our textile and apparel footwear products is pretty, pretty tough. Finally, when we've done all that, we bring it to our distribution center, right? We bring it in. We have a big distribution center down in Vidalia, Georgia. The Tommy Bahama one's in Seattle. The Lily Pulitzer one is in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. You might know where King of Prussia is. Right outside of Philly. Biggest mall in the country is the King of Prussia Mall. People will come there for the weekend and get a hotel to shop at the mall. I, I've never seen that, and that happens up there. Um, and just since I'm kind of a trivia geek, a lot of people will say the biggest mall in the United States is Mall of America's in Minneapolis. You guys ever heard of that? But Mall of America's has an amusement park in it. So if you're just counting retail square footage, King of Prussia Mall is the biggest in the country. Anyway, uh, we bring things to our distribution center. That's what our lovely distribution center in Vidalia, Georgia looks like. Isn't that a handsome building, right? And inside, and another thing, I said all sewing factories look alike inside. All distribution centers look alike, right? You walk inside these big, ugly buildings, and you don't, for a lot of reasons, you don't put a sign on it. Inside are thousands of Lily Pulitzer and Time Hummer, right? You don't want to get robbed. So, it's a lot of reason you guys buy e-commerce. You know, there's a big thing. I'm going on another tangent here. You know, there's a big difference of opinion in e-commerce about whether you want to put all your branding stuff on the box or not. You know, if like if we put Lily Pulitzer and put, ship it in a pink box, then sometimes we, you know, or do you ship it in a blank box? You know, just a plain old everyday cardboard box. And then when you open it up, all the all the the surprises in the box, right? There's a lot of different schools of thought about that. Uh, but we don't say inside is a couple million dollars worth of really cool stuff. Come break in tonight when we're not here. So all the buildings are ugly. Inside, they're all big racks full of all those cartons you saw at the back end of the factory in China slide, remember? Um, and then our customer service people get send them what's called picking tickets, which is really just a little order go and pull this many size small, this many large one, and send them to customer X. And most of our stuff goes out, good old FedEx. Uh, not that we have anything against UPS, but we do a, a bid, we make a bid for our business, and FedEx won the last one. So the next time we do it, UPS might win. They're really interchangeable this day and age. Um, when something goes out the door to our customer, uh, that's when we bill it, right? That's what this whole thing's been about, is we want to sell something and get some money so finally, after this whole supply chain, we ship something and we get to bill it and collect the money, hopefully. Big customers don't usually have to pay you until 60 days after you ship it to them. Ecom customers, that's why people who own brands like this like e-commerce, is you're paying when you check out, right? You give a credit card, get that, we get that money up front. We get it 
you know, we get up front. We get it at the time the stuff goes out the door, right? We like that. So the cash comes in when the product goes out. Wholesale business, really regardless of the brand or who the wholesale account is, Nordstrom, Walmart, Bloomingdale's, Kohl's, everybody in between, they buy so much that they command payment terms. They're not going to pay you in ships. Best you might, 30 days later is best. Normally the big retailers will pay you 60 days after you ship it to them. Uh, what else? Yeah, that's it on distribution. So I already mentioned kind of where our points of entry are. Lily stuff comes into New York and gets trucked to King of Prussia. Our Georgia stuff comes through Charleston and Savannah. Air Freight goes to Atlanta. Air Freight goes to New York. Um, we bring stuff in from Mexico. I'm sure a bunch of you guys have been to Panama City for fun and recreation. There's actually a little bitty port there, and we bring some stuff into Panama City from the Yucatan. Uh, Los Angeles is obviously a big entry point for goods from Asia. Uh, we don't own a distribution center there, but we pay a third party to do stuff for us. Because uh, think about it, you know, if the customer's facilities are west of the Mississippi, why does he want us to bring the stuff all the way to Vidalia, Georgia, and then ship it all the way back, you know, to California? So we kind of manage that case by case. Sales, our salespeople, some of you may end up in the front end of the business, which is to get business. What time do we turn into a pumpkin, Greg? Huh? Oh, God, I thought I had an hour. Okay. Uh, real quickly here, wholesale, retail, and e-commerce, those are called channels of distribution. Everybody has those. These what, regardless of what you're selling, right? Toys or clothes, right? Wholesale. You sell a lot of product, you don't make as much money on it, but a lot of people see it. Anybody know we did this promotion with Target and Lily Pulitzer? Remember that thing? A lot of people are like, like, Target with Lily Pulitzer? Well, that was just a free advertising campaign. We now have, you know, for all for the for the one out of a hundred people who said on Facebook, I'm never buying Lily again because you had it at Target, we picked up about ten people who'd never heard of the brand. Because the brand doesn't exist west of the Mississippi, really. It's a East Coast Preppy brand. Uh, retail, having your own retail stores, right? We make more money, we're keeping the profit, but we have the cost of having a store. We've got to pay rent, we've got to pay the people. E-commerce, everybody loves e-commerce, right? Because you make the most money off of it. There's nobody between your distribution center and the customer. Customer service, those people keep the customers happy, make sure our salespeople don't sell us out of business. Um, they handle anything that doesn't go right with a customer, including returns. Of course, you have returns with e-com. Lily's return rates, 24, 25% of everything goes out. One in four comes back. Why? Exactly. Everybody buys two because they're not sure if they're this or that. And y'all know everybody's sizing is different. There's no standard. And a lot of brands play with that. They like, you know, they, they make it seem like, you know, I really would like to be a four, so they I just think you're a four, right? They don't do that with men's clothing, do they, Greg? Yeah, no, yeah. We just, if you're fat, you got to admit it, you know. Uh, then behind the whole supply chain are all the people that keep the industry going. They pay the bills, keep our computers running, collect money from the customers, pay our bills, pay us, payroll, that's my favorite of these. They make sure they get paid. Human resources, and then we have people who are auditing and making sure nobody's stealing from the stores or stealing from ourselves. And so some of you might end up in any one of those functions one day. So that's it. I'm sorry I would have, I would have gotten, well, I stayed off the custom stage. Anybody that doesn't have to rush off to class that wants to stay and ask you questions, I don't have, when I leave here I have to go back and put painting clothes on and start painting again, so I'm in no hurry to leave. So. <laughs> questions, comments? Anybody planning to go into the apparel industry as a job? What you want to do? Well, I'm a uh, work for Missy Spider. Oh yeah, cool. Yep, very cool, very nice. Yep. So a little bit more of the front end yep. rather than the back end. But. Yep. Well, you know a lot of people, We I was talking to a lot of students at the fashion show the other night, the, you know, a, a, a lot of kids, they come, they get into a fashion degree program or a merchandising program or whatever, and it's like, obviously, everybody wants to be a famous designer, mm -hmm. but, you know, 99% of the jobs out there are buying, uh -huh. forecasting, planning that kind of stuff that again you got to have some business savvy but you got to have the left side the appreciation of the product too so all right